you're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour, and it's time for the finale of our coverage of The Bombay Prince by Sujata Massey. Mm. We are talking chapters 27 to 36 today here on the show. The latest iteration in the Perving Mystery series as we're recording at the moment. Herds, mm. you've made it. You've made it to the end of our Indian leg of this world tour. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> I'd like to thank I'd like to thank my family, my mother, my friends, my old university teacher, my, my lecturers. No, I, look, this has been a, such a wild ride through this book. Mm-hmm. I can't believe what a ramp up uh, of events and expectations that we have in the final stretch of this novel. I was blown away by the finale that we decided to throw ourselves into and the amount of stabbing that goes on. And strangling. It's crazy. I think it's also it's it's not just that the ramp up is so intense. Mm. It's that it like goes into kind of cruise control for a couple of chapters before things start ramping up and you're like, mm. is this novel gonna end? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, like I mean, even in the final scene we you know, we confront the murderer and their accomplice, you know, we get to we get to all that. It it doesn't feel like this is the final scene almost like, yeah, it feels like there's going to be a chase scene or some additional investigation to like prove they're the killer, Mm -hmm. but it's like, where do we go? And then the best character in the novels stabs a boy in the back and that's all we need. You know, (laughs) it's great. (laughs) Really crazy. Very silly. Yeah. We have these like few slice of life chapters leading up into that stretch, which are fascinating in their own right and enjoyable because of how, like well fleshed out the characters in them are yeah <laughs> it just kind of all comes to a head so quickly yeah i mean it's it's prompted you know we, we're going to uh I, I believe it's to deliver some some paperwork yep to the family of the victim for any uh cutting master and we just kind of coincidentally go to check in on uh on on koresh who is apparently dying of what seems yeah, like, to be poison violently like, ill it, it comes out of complete nowhere. Like, obviously, the foreshadowing. He's in bed and yeah. he's like, I deserve this. And Perveen so just says, we have got to yeah. get this boy to we a hospital. We have to save him. And his mother, his life, his yeah. mother says, he'll be fine. Oh, well, we'll take him to the cheap hospital a few hours away. It's so and interesting. Perveen's like, no. Like, it's it's not like it's not foreshadowed all the way through this novel. Every time we see Koresh, he's like, and bullied around by Naval. He's very, like, meek. He doesn't seem like mm-hmm. he entirely knows what's going on. And so seeing him there, like, on the edge of the bed, you know, he's thrown up. He's not eating. He's he's trying desperately to avoid d- doing anything with his with his life because he thinks it's over. Yeah. And, and Paveen just happens to come along and be his little guardian angel there. It's fantastic. It's a really interesting sequence, too, because I feel like in most murder mystery novels this would have been the second like the, the middle part this would have been week the two twist, for us, right normal yeah exactly like whoa who's trying to poison caress what does he know yeah exactly. it gets so <laughs> slammed up against the back and yeah then even after we do that we still kind of like diffuse for a little bit before action kicks back up again like you know sajati massey is clearly trying to like disarm you as the end approaches and then it's it's all kind of abrupt you know, we go to check it on Koresh. We find out that someone has been seeing him, someone who claims he's his brother, I believe. Yeah. And they just Goodness. want to take him who for a Who could it be? Who could it be? And, well, I mean, uh, shall we get into oh, it? We, we should also mention oh, at this yeah, point yeah. Uh, that one of, the, one of the scenes that we've had in the middle is that uh, Dinesh Apti, who's been in prison this entire time, yes. is being charged oh with goodness. Freni's death, and Perveen's like debating whether or not she's going to defend him. It's such a good scene, too. Oh my goodness, we have to talk about this. I had, that scene had completely slipped my mind. I feel terrible. Yeah, because yeah, we had this whole interrogation of Dinesh, and the other thing, which again, this ties into the like coincidences that allow Perveen to kind of be at the exciting moment of of the case or of the of the drama. Yeah, like. Dinesh was supposed to be represented by a very prestigious lawyer, I suppose. Yeah, Perveen's dad um, says he's like the best criminal lawyer in Bombay. But as the case kind of turned fouler, the, the prestigious lawyer decided to hand it off to, I assume his intern, uh, <laughs> this like other lawyer who doesn't know what he's talking about. Some and so schmuck. When, and so when this schmuck says, oh, I got to go off for a coffee, Perveen, 
she's like, oh, I suppose that means I won't be able to see Dinesh today because yeah. normal policy is that you're, you're not supposed to be able to see another lawyer without your lawyer being present because they can manipulate you. And he's like, no, no, you can just go right here. Just go have a chat with him. <laughs> be, I don't see the harm in that. It almost feels like a conspiracy. I was waiting for someone to pop up at the end and say, aha, I was that schmuck all along. I mean, I was, there's a like- lot of stuff in this stretch that feels like <laughs> conspiratorial. There's that scene where she like runs into Colin outside the Asiatic Society. Yeah. And oh, no. like it's this very innocuous scene where they're just kind of having a vaguely flirtatious conversation and being a little <sighs> bit apologetic that they haven't been able to meet up. And then and it's written with the aura <laughs> that like someone is watching them. But that's that's what's so good about it. Oh my goodness. Because they end up in like the secret garden where it's like a public place. But no one's looking at them. Like no one's yeah. like around. They can kind of hear that people are nearby. It's like, are we gonna get found out? And then they're looking deeply into each other's eyes, <laughs> and no one knows who started kissing first. But it happens. Lord, it happens. Best scene in the book. Oh my goodness. Ah, oh, <laughs> I wanted to get right into the mystery on this one, Flex. But oh, you're just no, reminding me of impossible. all the best parts of this story. I mean, and this is the ah. thing: is like, I, I, I think that. The way that we're discussing this is adequately conveying <laughs> yeah. how disjointed the end of it feels, but it's not like yeah. problematically no, disjointed. It's, it's just that these puzzle pieces could go in any order, and Sujata Massey has like picked a really bizarre <laughs> order at that. Yeah, it's it's pretty great. Anyway, yeah. So all, all of this is to say that we we pick up the pieces through Koresh's personality and and he's you know the the terrible things he's going through and Dinesh's testimony. And I mean, there's some kind of hard clues that we go through, like we figure out mm. because the servant says, you know, I heard someone breathe in the library and it turns out to be uh, D- Dinesh, I believe, or, or I believe it is Dinesh. I think so. And, you know, we, we talk about how there were two boys seen hopping over the fence from the nearby like hotel complex, that sort of thing. And all of it is to say that in the end, really, it was all about one psychopath who wanted to have his way and was willing to manipulate the people around him to get what he wanted. Because we do we do find out, as I've kind of alluded to, that Naval Hotawala is is the killer. Well done. Uh, effectively. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to be brief about this. I think you yeah. can walk away with, with three points I'll, from this one. I'm happy one. with that. Because honestly, like, I definitely screwed up on Koresh. I don't know what you're thinking, but when I read... You know the the motivation for for Naval. I was like, yeah, that that pretty much lines up with what I said. But with Koresh, apparently the manipulation was you need money to go to school. Yeah. Whereas I was like, oh, it's clearly to do with that boy who died eight years ago, or however long ago it was. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's curious because it's not explicitly denied, which is why I was like, no. kind of unsure about it when we were speaking between these episodes. It's kind of a theme of this book, though, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, but. It, it's not explicitly confirmed either, which means I can't really land you the points for it. No, I'm, I'm happy with three. I think that I was definitely stretching uh, at that point. Do we want to talk about the spy in the room as well? Oh my God, can we please? <laughs> the best character? I did not see this coming at all. <laughs> and I I was in a fit of giggles when Sajada Massey confirmed the identity and purpose of J.P. Singer. He's a, a government spy. Um, he's, he's an American government yes. spy who may, may <laughs> have been there to assassinate the prince. May have. Look, we don't know for sure, but we don't know that. He may have been there. It's not clear if he is, as I kind of mentioned last week, if he is or isn't the plainclothes detective who's uh, mentioned in the early parts of the story. Yes. I like to think that he is. I like to think I he think, is I think as well. I hadn't idea. thought of it, but when you said it, I was like, oh my God, it, it, that's so tidy. Yeah, it, it, it works. I, I mean, look, Sajada, you, you can steal that one. That's for free. <laughs> um, but but clearly, yeah, he's there for ulterior motives. And whether it's to assassinate the prince or protect him, clearly that's what's on the agenda. Yeah. What I love about his character, about Jay's character, is that in the moment where we confront Naval and Naval is trying to kill Paveen, which is an insane scene, by the way. So it's, intense. It's it's awful. I thought, are we actually going to kill this character? Surely not. The tension is suddenly relieved as Naval, and he pulls back, and I think he falls into the fountain. I hope he did anyway. It's that whole cleansing symbolism thing. 
and he has a knife in his back or, or a knife wound in his back. Yeah. And there's Jay standing there and it's a very quick scene where Jay just says, yeah, I may not be, you know, the casual lackadaisical reporter you thought I was. Please let me get away. That'd be really nice of you, Pervin. And he runs off into the night. <laughs> but there's a lot implied by the moment because obviously he's a spy. He's supposed to like yeah. think about things strategically. And so he, in this moment, is thinking, what is the most ethical, efficient way that I can solve this problem? Because I can't get caught here. You know, I can't you know, restrain Naval. I can't restrain Interesting. the murderer because then I get caught in that in that chase or in like having to answer questions. Why are you holding this young man, right? I understand your point here that he kind of had to go for the kill because he had it's to. the least risky situation. But at the same time, it was the most he still solution. kind of doesn't get away with it. Not quite. Uh, and, you know, he's still fallen on his sword for Purveen, who he's yeah. kind of been a, a B-side love interest for. It's great. He puts himself and- at immense risk. It's fantastic. Yeah. I really like that when we're wrapping up the crime that it's kind of treated that the murder of Frenny has almost been like de facto pinned on JP mm-hmm. because yep. Naval isn't around to confirm yeah. it anymore. Well, it, it ties into what I was saying last week about how we're constantly subverting these regular murder mystery tropes. And the, the easiest one is the suspect lineup. And, the you know, yeah. now we're going to try them. We're going to lay out all the evidence against Naval, but we don't get any of that because we got a spy who needs to get the heck out of there? He doesn't have time for any of that nonsense. <laughs> we had to cut to the chase. You know, I I love that so much. It's such a it's such a fun solution. Though I I suppose on the more mystery side, though, like I, I don't feel like there's much of a way to see the JP Singer twist coming, which I don't have a problem with because it's, it's such a great reveal and twist at the end. But part of me as a mystery fan was also kind of craving that there'd be a few more clues yeah, his way. I, I feel like the, the the mystery is like, it's interesting in this novel, but I don't feel like the mystery is what kept me hooked. Definitely. You know, like there's not a puzzle. It's it's just about following these characters' journeys and, and following Perveen's, uh, <laughs> you know, f- following her attempts to solve the murder and how she gets these crazy situations. Yeah, I think spies. there's definitely, like, if you go back through the novel and, and to Sajada Massey's credit here, you can still see the foreshadowing mm. and all of the things that make way more sense in hindsight that way. Sure. Which is, you know, I guess the thing I crave more than the puzzle, so I'm I'm still totally happy with it. Mm-hmm. But I would be very, very surprised if anyone managed to get ahead of that particular reveal because there's <laughs> almost, like, no reason for it to happen in the story. It's, yeah. it's so unmotivated, but nonetheless, less compelling yeah like i mean i mean i i figured that jay was you know there was more to jay than met the eye but i would not have picked him as a spy working for the american government i would not have gone in that direction but i i'm glad that someone did you know it's almost (laughs) weird because as you were saying like there's so much subversion of the tropes here but the like one foreign guy being a spy for the government is like the one we commit to and it's amazing it's the knox rule right there must be no american in the in the story right exactly (laughs) (laughs) but as always there's the way you can subvert that trope and have it be a, a good fun time and you know not feel unfair which i think has been very well done anyhow i think we should wrap this part of the discussion here we've got a little bit of a twist coming up for the end of our indian leg in the back of the show Mm. so stick around for that this is your murder mystery world tour here on 2ser 107.3 You're listening to Death of the Reader. We've been in India for a little while here on your Murder Mystery World Tour, and we've come to the end of that leg of said tour with Sajada Massey's The Bombay Prince. We've been discussing all the way to the end of that novel today, and Herds, I wanted to dial back Mm -hmm. a little bit, not all the way on the spoilers for... Uh, the Bombay Prince, but I also wanted to dial up a little bit, not all the way, uh-huh. on the spoilers from the other Indian novels that we've covered, because if you've been reading along with this the whole time, it should be very apparent to you why I chose to wrap the leg up with this particular book. <laughs> I mean, we, we were talking about how this novel ends with a talk being given, and on mm. instinct, I said, ah, oh, yes, 
Pavin, she decides to give the talk at the end of this novel. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, and then I realize, wait a second, no, that's not this novel. That's 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 Dying Day. This is the one where she decides to attend someone else's talk. Yes. <laughs> It's pretty there good. are pretty good parallel. a staggering number of parallels in the Bombay Prince. I mean, we referenced the same real life crime that happened mm-hmm. as the one the uh, Nev yeah. March mentioned in Murder in Old Bombay. We have the same weird espionage journey that we did in The Shadows of Men. Mm-hmm. We deal with the same character journey that we did in The Dying Day. It's just, mm. it's such a nice foot to land on it's at a, the end yeah. of this leg. It's an excellent cap uh, on on the journey so far. And that's not to say that we won't come back to Indian uh, novels in the future. Oh, yeah. And just for the record, people keep messaging me being like, when are you going back to Japan? Eventually. Okay. Uh, (laughs) At some point. Look, we can only do it so many times a year. Okay. Or every two years, as the case may be. But, you know, it's always good to do a stint through a country and kind of explore, you know, all these different authors that work in the same space and, and influence each other. Right. It's like. The fun. And so much of it covers the same history, right? Mm, you know, mm. think about the stuff that you would have learned about wherever you grew up in school. There's a lot of similar themes, ideas, and events. And I don't want to call it an oversimplification mm. of India. It's a, but it's a certain perspective, right? Yeah. We're seeing, it, I mean, it's not the same perspective. We're seeing several authors' perspective on the same cultural journey that they grew up with, right? And I, I really like that as a slice of India to look at through crime fiction because mm. it not only shows you like the great diversity that there is and all of the different facets of India that these authors were able to write about within a very similar structural framework. Sure. But it also goes to show how, you know, India is kind of seen by the outside world where despite being in ostensibly a po- post-colonial era, we still view it through a very colonial lens. Yeah, I mean, we've we've talked about this on the show before, how so many, like, the records of the, the history of India have been, I mean, not entirely wiped clean, but, you know, colonialism definitely did a number on it. Um, <laughs> so I think that any author's attempt to kind of analyze that, that period of history and and even to, you know, recapture something from from before is, you know, really admirable. I also found it fascinating. I, I kind of want to get your opinion on this, Herds, that sure. so much of what we've seen has been about the, like, flashpoints when India pushed back, <laughs> if that makes sense. The uh, idea sure. that, you know, maybe these authors are kind of, like, rebellious, uh, <laughs> optimistic <laughs> about the abilities that people have to resist uh, uh-huh, the power sure. structures that they live within. I like that you switched out the term uh, rebellious for resistant. Uh, I, that's that's a clever... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. No, this is in reference to a panel from uh, Sydney's Bad Crime Writers Festival that I've brought up a couple of times on this show. And I thought, I mean, let's hear from Solari at that panel, uh, which you can now catch up online at their YouTube page, talking about what this literature of resistance idea is. At its heart, crime fiction is about someone standing up and saying no. It's about someone resisting an injustice and doing something about it. A lot of people would look for the crime in crime fiction as a as a marker of our genre. But it's not so much that. The crime, yes, necessarily has to occur, but it is the resistance to the crime, the resistance to uh, an injustice that follows that is really the the heart of a, a crime fiction novel. See, I, I might have I might have been to that one. It's been so long. I feel like it's been a lifetime. But, <laughs> I mean, I remember the, the idea of resistance. I remember learning about that back when I was in university. Yeah. There was a, a, a subject that I took which is about graffiti as a mode of mm. resistance and how, you know, people put, they put ads on billboards and then someone graffitis over it. And the graffiti is like the problematic element there. It's not the, yeah. the, the ads being displayed in the local neighborhood that never asked for the ad to be put there. You know, who, which one is the eyesore? Obviously that's a debate that I, I can't settle on my own. Well, it, and it's also a debate that, you know, is going to vary a lot by context. You Absolutely. Without naming names, yeah. there's a particular chain of billboards that have been mm. uh, celebratedly defaced in, yes. in Australia at the moment. Which, well, exactly. Which is like, you know, 
in many ways the same act, but it's viewed publicly so differently. Yeah, for sure. And I think that, uh, not to say that Indian authors that we've covered on the show are the, are the graffiti authors of, of our show. I don't know where I'm going with this, but <laughs> but I, I do think that you, you're onto something there with the idea that authors who choose to write about times of unrest, but, but not just times of unrest, but ones which lead to positive change, mm. even though I think most of the stories we've covered look at that change with a, a critical lens, yeah. not to go too in depth into old Bombay, but the, the kind of cultural exchange that occurred, you know, that yeah. has occurred between the British and, and India You know, it is two-sided. Yeah, and that's like one of the really compelling things about murder in old Bombay. I mean, Nev March said it here herself. This is about a particular small community of Parsis. And what that means is a very small community, less than 100,000 people in the whole world, had an enormous effect on the history of India. This is a little bit of a crusade for me to try to modernize my community. And the way I chose to do it was from the point of view of an outsider who loves them. I mean, the same with like Abhir Mukherjee as well, where he's talking about how we learn the same Mm. history, but Indian history is in many ways, in his own words, sometimes more valid. Sure. What always struck me was why are we not looking at our own history? Why are we not looking at the corruption in our, in ourselves? Uh, And the answer is we didn't, we don't really want to, we don't like shining a mirror on our own past. We learn about these instances from 500 years ago in British history, but we don't, we don't see the the history of 50 years ago or 60 years ago, things that actually changed things or, or things that matter. We, we keep quiet or we brush under the carpet. All of these clips I'm playing, aside from the one from Bad Sydney Crime Writers Festival, by the way, are up on the podcast in their various episodes with these authors. So go have a look there. Nev March and Abia Mukherjee we've just heard from. And yeah, the bits that haven't been erased by colonialism kind of have to serve as a bit of a lesson. I mean, there's the age old adage that if you're in a situation where you have, when you have one truth that is being trumpeted by a power, the British colonial power, and then you have a a less powerful, you know, a a minority group speaking their own truth, um, it is worth listening to the to the minority and understanding their perspective. I think one of the great things about the Bombay Prince as a concluding piece for that is the way that so much of it is about speech. Despite being a crime novel, most of the scenes that we have aren't sitting down with the suspects and grilling them on what happened, not having chase scenes and dramatic confrontational encounters. Most of it's like attending regular social sure. day job life yeah. and still working towards this sense of justice and social progress. I honestly, <laughs> I I could read the book without the murder mystery, I think, and still have a really great time. Well, I mean, that's been so true for so many of these novels, right? Like, sure. sure. You know, murder in old Bombay. It's, it's real. If you were to, yeah. yeah. If you were to take out, the murder mystery parts you have a love like story invention novel well- <laughs> buried in there with a love story built in is fantastic if you were to just give me like history tour that vasim khan was reaching for in the dying day you'd sure. have a fantastic story and if you were to supplant the just absolute chaos of the shadows of men you'd be fine anywhere like the only novel we covered in our indian leg that's inseparable Uh is avi romans and that's deliberate as well like he deliberately set out to write a golden age style detective novel and there are plenty of other books that he's written i i talked about fraudster kind of during that stretch in which again you could probably take out the murder and still have a a pretty good time. Obviously, this is a fact that's true for like most good <laughs> crime fiction these sure. days. Uh, I was speaking with Aoife Clifford a while ago uh, ahead of the Sydney Writers Festival about her novel When We Fall and how she felt that there wasn't any reason to not have a good murder mystery and a good story at the same time. The beauty of crime fiction, the hand it sort of puts out to the reader and says, not only do I want you to enjoy this read, I want you to actively read it by trying to solve it along with me. And the the joy of trying to solve it before the main character does, awesome. I'm a greedy reader. I want the books I read to have great characters, great sentences, 
And also you can still have the puzzle and that puzzle shouldn't be kind of diminished. That chat with Aoife Clifford ahead of the Sydney Writers Festival is going up on the podcast pretty soon. So make sure you're subscribed up there if you aren't already. And yeah, as she says in that interview, that's kind of a standard that existed because that's just what writers had achieved so far. But we're kind of past that. Yeah, well, I mean, not to go too far back or get too philosophic here, but obviously the the traditional crime fiction stories are games, right? Yes. They're there to have fun. They're there to, like, that's what the Detection Club was all about. You sit around, you have your tea, and you talk about, oh, what chapter will I write next? Maybe you'll guess who the murderer was, <laughs> but where was the butler? And that's sometimes how we treat this this show as well, you know, with the point system and, like, everybody's – we're solving the murder, you know, we're switching back and forth. But crime fiction as a genre in the way that it uh, has, has been melded with other genres and other styles of fiction – obviously is much more than a game now. It is a way to often highlight the mysteries of the world, um, the hidden truths of cultures that we're not always privy to. Yeah. And I think now that I've said that, finally just stated that thought, that's that's kind of how I, I feel India has less, left its impression on me. Yeah. Detective fiction in this culture is being used to highlight the hidden truths of of British colonialism and the way that it has impacted the culture. I want to I want to expand on that and rebut a little bit. Sure. Because on the one hand, I think you're absolutely right. That's totally what Indian crime fiction has left its impression on me, but I don't want to make the suggestion in that that crime fiction is somehow the only type of fiction or the only type of writing that can do oh, that. Ooh. But the thing that crime fiction does well for me is it makes a very palatable entry point sure. for that right you know the as we were talking about uh during the dying day how a lot of historical fiction readers love treating the genre as a sounding board to then go and learn more history there's more of a constant sense of turmoil that indian crime fiction tackles it's a good one you know even in that modern snapshot in a dire isle that there is so much more to india all of these other territories we haven't seen these other cultures in the country that we haven't touched like had you heard of bundelkhand before we covered a dire isle i'd be surprised if so yeah and you know through that there are so many different entry points to understanding india sure and no matter where you step first it would only be the beginning. I think it's 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 interesting watching you skirt around the supernatural elements of a dire isle, but I I agree. I agree with what you're going for there. Yeah, I mean the supernatural <laughs> stuff is something that hasn't really come up a lot in covering the Indian fiction that we have. And when we were talking with Avi Raman, you know, maybe there's still a bit of work internally that has to happen. See, India in many ways, you know, it's an extremely old civilization, thousands of years old. And we have myths and stories which go back with donkey's years. One of the things that's been happening in the Indian fiction market over the last 10 years is a lot of these old epics and classics are being reinterpreted. They are being rewritten for the young audience. Many of these epics are written from a male's viewpoint. So you have uh, writers now who are writing it from a female character's viewpoint. And so it seems like it's only a matter of time, right? You know, mythological archetypes are fun, right, Herds? I love the myth of Icarus. It's my favorite one. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea which book we're poking fun at here. Any book, any book, any book that I has mean, Greek exactly, mythology right? in it. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. So I hope here at the end of our current Indian leg uh, of our Murder Mystery World Tour that you've found your foothold to get into the world uh, of Indian fiction and enjoy some of the absolute treats that are there. Awesome. But at the very least, Herds, it's time for us to depart and I know. get back. We're, we're having a bit of a shake-up too. Like, I, I don't even know what book we're doing. I mean, I do, but- You do know what book we're doing. And the reason we both know is because neither of us is the expert. It's true. Time. We're going in blind into John, John Dixon Carr's The Crooked Hinge. Yes, we have Brad Freeman back from the R Suite Mystery Blog. Back from the dead. He joined us last year for Halloween Party for our Halloween special. Mm. And we're having him back on to finally get him the chance to challenge us to his favorite puzzle oh, in murder mystery. It's so exciting. Finally, I can listen to somebody else rant about their favorite murder mystery and, and tell me all these high concept theses 
It's going to be great. I'm looking forward to it. (laughs) Next week on the show, we are covering Death of a Man, which is chapters one to six of The Crooked Hinge by John Dixon Carr. I am frightened Mm. and excited. I'm horrified. Herds, thank you for joining me on this Indian tour. It's been great being here. I'm looking forward to a change. And who, who knows what the future may hold? Crooked Hinge, let's go. Let's go. This is Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour here on 2SER 107.3. We'll see you with Crooked Hinge next week. We're out of here.